As uh, now we go to our final witness, uh, uh, who is here on behalf of the People for Equality and Relief in uh, Lanka, um, Ms. Uh, Ravi Chandriva. Uh, welcome. Uh, you have five minutes for your opening remarks. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, esteemed committee members, for this opportunity to address the issue of sanctions in Sri Lanka specifically. Um, I would first like to begin by expressing uh, the gratitude of Pearl for Canada's ongoing support and commitment to human rights and justice and for its continued leadership in the fight for accountability in Sri Lanka. My name is Archana Ravichandra Deva, and I am the Executive Director of People for Equality and Relief in Lanka. Pearl. We're a nonprofit organization led by human rights activists concerned about the situation in Sri Lanka. We bring together research, advocacy, and activism to promote and protect the human rights of Tamil people in the northeast of the island. Despite overwhelming evidence of the Sri Lankan government committing war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide of the Tamil people, especially in the final stages of the 26-year-long armed conflict, Sri Lanka is yet to deliver on any justice or accountability. Today, the human rights situation in Sri Lanka continues to worsen. Uh, Singhala Buddhist nationalism, which we consider to be a root cause of the conflict, continues to drive irrational policies that cause harm to the Tamil community. Issues of militarization remain high in Tamil areas in the Northeast, and Tamil politicians, activists, and civil society advocating for justice and accountability continue to experience significant constraints on their advocacy. The few domestic mechanisms that Sri Lanka has, for example, the Office of Missing Persons is often seen as one of their um, flagship me uh, mechanisms lack independence, impartiality, and have lost the trust of victim survivors. So it is in this context that international actions, such as sanctions, can have a profound impact, especially against bad actors who continue to hold deeply entrenched positions of power and authority within the Sri Lankan government. Now, Canada has been a strong advocate for the Tamil community for a uh, by example, recognizing the Tamil genocide last year, Canadian sanctions that were implemented in January 2023 on former presidents Gotabaya Rajapaksa and Mahinda Rajapaksa, Staff Sergeant Sunil Ratnayaka and Lieutenant Commander Chandana Prasad Hadirachi are uh, some of the few, if not uh, only, individual actions of accountability against Sri Lankan leaders, which is of symbolic importance to a war that was supposed to be a war without witnesses. The sanctions are the only international individual accountability measures against the Rajapaksa brothers specifically who orchestrated the violence. Many of the victim survivors that Pearl connects to in Sri Lanka almost uh, regularly mention the sanctions as one of the few and positive developments in an accountability landscape, which often feels bleak and impossible. However, we must recognize that current sanctions are just a starting point, and it's crucial to expand the list of individuals and entities subject to sanctions, including Magnitsky-style sanctions, for those responsible for the war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and other human rights abuses committed during the armed conflict. We also have to acknowledge that sanctions are not the be-all and end-all and are likely to be unsuccessful in the absence of other measures. So Pearl robustly advocates for sanctions to be supported with Canadian engagement in other areas, such as international justice efforts, including through universal jurisdiction, international courts, etc., to develop a multilateral approach to justice. I'd also like to speak really briefly about the process in which Pearl engages in advocacy in Canada and how the system can be bettered for other advocacy organizations as it relates to sanctions. So we began connecting with representatives and having meetings with Global Affairs Canada for several years before the sanctions were confirmed, along with many other Tamil organizations. And for example, there's often a lack of clarity about whether we focus 
sanctions advocacy are under the Special Economic Measures Act or the Magnitsky Act, whether our advocacy with global affairs has been translating across other departments, including, for example, the Department of Justice, um, and what kinds of information need to be shared or gathered from advocacy organizations to support the effort, as well as the greater need to understand the difference between the sanctions regime on one side and the ERPA on the other, which has its own internal internal mechanisms against allowing individuals ac accused of human rights violations into the country. And during the process of our advocacy, there was also sometimes a lack of information about what the impact and implementation of these sanctions would be once implemented. And so I wanted to take some time from the perspective of an advocacy organization to talk about the importance of greater cohesion and consistency in terms of applying the existing uh, sanctions re regime and how to work together. Uh, more guidance and policy framework. Uh, I think a witness before spoke about policy information for organizations and activists to engage in advocacy around sanctions and how to uh, make sanctions more effective in their implementation after the initial proclamation. So thank you, Mr. Chair and the rest of the committee members. I'm happy to answer any questions on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 